Hey, Tim, welcome to Stories in AI. What a pleasure to have you here today. Ganesh, it's great to do this with you. Uh, you know, I've been a big fan for many years. We met, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm trying to which investment bank it was at the top of, and you were giving a, a talk there. And uh, it's been great yeah. to see what you've done with this and brought some really fun people on. So happy to be one. No, thank you. Thank you. That was actually, I think, Bank of America it was one of their investor day. Uh, and yeah, we, we were right. both in the state together. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I was, it was still, I would consider, really early days for AI, right? In terms of like people who are trying mm -hmm. to spell what it is, trying to figure out how can they actually do anything with it and stuff, it's like 2016 or something. Um, but, you know, we've come a long way. But before I dive into AI and, you know, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna get the audience to listen to your DR story, like digital reasoning, you know, you build a company. I was just telling you, like you're the OG of NLP and OG of AI, <laughs> making it practical for, for the industry to adopt, right? So, uh, but before all that, Give me your backstory. Who is Tim Estes? Give me your background. Just, you know, um, educate us a little bit about you. Yeah, no, I yeah, appreciate that. So um, I guess you know, I'm a Nashville kid. And so I think you can't really tell the story of, of me and digital reasoning without basically saying that, you know, like we're from, you know, we're here, we're from Nashville, we're doing AI, we're doing it in the early 2000s. And, you know, we're here to find bad guys that knocked down some of our buildings and killed thousands of people. And so like, you know, that was a very interesting life to live at the very beginning. Uh, it wasn't the most investable story early on. You know, I spent my decade in the wilderness sure. on that, but yeah. I was, a, uh, I went to University of Virginia, a very proud Wahoo. And um, I essentially focused on philosophical um, theology initially, uh, and then into philosophy of language. And so I was interested in like lots of order, you know, you come out of the South, uh, you grow up, you know, sort of in interesting Christian circles. And, and, uh, so I had a lot of influence on me there, which is still true today. Uh, and I cared a lot about, you know, finding order in the world. Um, and then it turned out that instead of being abstract or political, both of which felt like they were not very useful to the world. Um, I thought it was interesting to say, you know, could you, basically try to find meaning in data by examining with such depth that the, the model would emerge from the data. Um, and so the thesis was, you know, our world isn't a bunch of chaos and randomness. It's going to have order that's not too hard to find if you get the math right and scale it. And so that's kind of where the algorithms came from. Originally, digital reasoning was looking at the invariance of symbol use over time, very clustering driven, very early. Uh, it was, you know, probably... I know, one five thousandth of computed today, so those algorithms were very challenging. Uh, so, so yeah, that was kind of the early story. Was you know, I was probably a you know a mediocre computer scientist and engineer at best. Uh, I quickly got people that are radically more talented and smart and building things out than I, I am slash probably ever would be. Um, as like this, Bill Gates once said, you know, when he was getting back into technology, he never coded, just threatened to code again. And, uh, and so I, you know, so I had to learn a lot on the side with it. My background was mostly in uh, mathematical logic and, you know, that I love the journey and the story of the people that emerged out of philosophy um, and became the fathers, you know, and the mothers of computer science. So, you know, Wittgenstein was a philosopher I studied the most in school. Alan Turing was probably his most famous student. Um, and there is this unbroken chain, you know, from him to Gerdell and others that uh, ended up making a lot of what we take for granted today. Um, but when you understand where it came from, you know, there is this uh, journey that we went on, which was focusing on computation and formal systems. And we forgot that we were trying to create systems that could make truth communicatable and discoverable, which is where the whole journey came from with David Hilbert. Uh, and so like, this is sort of a journey I wanted to pick back up by trying to bridge unstructured data into machines. Uh, and, you know, very abstract ideas, you're 21, 22 year old when you start, that was me. Um, and, you, had, you know, kind of take uh, the algorithms that were available to you and invent other ones because none of them could find this kind of order very well. I mean, it was going to be, you had to think of word vectors were 13 years away from when we started, 13 years. So wow. uh, having alternatives to that, that were actually working at some scale in 2005, 2006, doing, you know, unsupervised entity resolution from textual data that worked a little bit, at least enough to find good aliases of bad guys so you could separate, you know, the people that had the same name from the really bad people that, you know, and so, so that was kind of the, the first decade of it. Uh, and it, it goes by in a bit of a blur, like you're, 
you know, childhood memories before you're 10. That's a fascinating backstory, Tim. I think, you know, what's what really, uh, you know, is amazing about that is like you, you started with that, like the why part of it, which is like, how do you make truth discoverable? And you, 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 and how do you actually just make it, you know, accessible for everybody to use that as a means to drive order in the world? And it's more true today than it was ever, ever was today, right? I think, and, and mm-hmm. to your thing about like what y'all had to really innovate on because, you know, deep learning didn't exist uh, at back at the time. Vectors didn't exist, as you just said, right? It's just so, so much of ground, ground truth innovation you had to do to get to set the infrastructure. The other thing I always, when I meet like folks who have been in AI for like decades right now, they tell me like, look, earlier AI or machine learning wasn't just building the model. It's about making sure you're setting up the infrastructure, right? It's about making sure mm-hmm. that you can look at the data, right? I mean, you had to literally build the entire infrastructure from the compute to the uh, the abstractions, to the models, to the libraries, and everything was like bespoke and done. And, you know, I think we've come a long way today from where that was, right? And so let me ask you that. When you look at it today, and you've had this amazing 20, year of, 20 years of 20, 22 years since you started Digital Reasoning, of growing up with the industry while you were growing the company, go through the teenage years, go through the adolescence and all that kind of stuff, right? Where has that led to right now? What is that journey? Be? What's the vantage point today when you look at it and say, where is AI today? Well, I, I think that we are at a really unique inflection point in AI. Um, if I look at it from more of the market standpoint and the way it's impacting the culture, so if you kind of look back 20 years, I mean, I started this when probably the leading uh, tech in the tech space was mainly latent semantic indexing and very limited, you know, turn document type matrices being used for document level similarity with, with fairly weak results. I mean, you're getting 30 percent approximately better search ranking out of it. But, you know, anything subtle, anything that switched context paragraph by paragraph was just blowing up the machine. Uh, it wasn't until I think sometime in the early 2000s that someone created a relatively scalable way uh, to actually do incremental indexing updates of LSI because the problem was that you had to re-index the whole document set every time. And then someone found a very you know, clever way to use partial differential equations and actually do that without needing to do that. Um, and so a lot of the e-discovery companies, for instance, that still are strong today, uh, like recommended others, like they emerged as like, you know, children and grandchildren of that tech from the nineties and, and so forth. Um, and so, that was a document-based yeah. world. Uh, what needed to happen was the, the there were two movements that needed yeah. to happen that both of all happen now. Uh, and one, one's still a little bit of work in progress. So there's really been, I believe, um, you know, two different uh, approaches to basically training, training data into knowledge. You know, one, and, uh, and it's funny, uh, in, in, as a philosopher, there's a lot of Aristotelian versus Platonic kind of, you know, dialectic going on with two approaches. Yeah. You know, one sort of models the world, you know, the ontological, the structure of the graph. So yeah. that's a big bias. And then there is the, you know, uh, you know, the, the almost Aristotelian notice of cowness that comes from the cow and kind of it's experienced and then it gets indexed into the system. And so it's pattern recognition, building abstractions up for invariance and patterns. And that's connectionist now. Right. So that's a lot of the DL stuff today. Uh, and so those schools had been there for a long time. Like they, they date back 60, 70 years with different technologies. And so what happened was um, we, when 9-11 hit and we had this massive problem of being able to retro that we knew enough to stop it from happening. And things were, you know, actions weren't taken and we had spent all this money in infrastructure. And what had happened was between essentially politics between groups and then the, in, the inability of a single truth set to emerge and give us warning even though that raw data was there, you know, we had this almost Manhattan experiment of spending tens of billions of dollars on all this tech. And both of those yeah. approaches actually got funding. Now I'd say the model based approach has got a lot more funding because it was accessible. So what that meant is like building up, you know, a taxonomy of, you know, looking for these kind of people, these kinds of activities. Um, and so you had a lot of emphasis on entities and relationships. And so we were trying to do that from the textual data. Yeah. Uh, directly without you know, any real, not much in the way of any extraction and categorization yeah. other pieces. Um, and what we would see happen, you know, especially around 2014 to 2018, was a huge leap in classification technology, the ability to essentially no longer have to feature engineer through human means, but have the machines 
develop their own features. And that yeah. was the breakthrough. The breakthrough really yeah. was not needing to structure the data from a feature gen uh, and feature extraction standpoint, but essentially these very clever techniques that emerged from two or three of the you know, modern fathers of deep learning to do that. Um, and that unleashed, you know, massive gains in image net type scores, other pieces. So that's the algorithmic element. The data sets also got radically more interesting. The compute got interesting. So there's been an ongoing debate about, you know, how much of the algorithm was really that much better versus how much the data sets have gotten to be interesting enough to train them. And the compute has gotten essentially so vast, you could be immensely wasteful and still get something interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right now, I'm kind of giving another point. Right now, what's happened is we've gone through five, six years of that. And we have classification technology that's really quite remarkable. It still has some interesting, weird failure cases, but those failure cases are increasingly odd. So you know, conventional use of speech recognition for commands, conventional use of you know, search by image example, those things work pretty darn well versus four or five years ago. Yep. And they have a huge vocabulary, right? And so, so that work has happened. Um, and now dealing with the subtle semantics has happened because of transformers and a basically, you know, another level of attention based architectures that turn into transformers. Um, so what's happened really is we have created a way to bootstrap a weak, uh, quasi semantic model of the world from large amounts of data of various kinds. We're beginning to create a model of the world that actually understands well relationships across different modalities, data image, text, yep. speech, other things. Uh, we're starting to create generative capability from the same models, which is all this Lambda, you know, kind of scandal of Google. Would, you know, is it sentient or not? That's happened the last, you know, three or four weeks. And, you know, you talk to anyone, I think fairly interesting Google, they can explain to you why it's not. Uh, but having said that, you know, it's, it's interesting that it's getting clever enough, you know, to fool you. And so it's kind of getting to that Turing test level. Um, yes. So what does this yep. mean? That means these tools that are vastly powerful are now becoming effective for large compute houses and large data houses. So what comes next is that arms race needs to go back to the PC, back to the, the edge, and back to the person. And so I think the work in sparse networks, essentially you know, nearly equivalent prediction capabilities from vastly more computationally efficient models and customized hardware that is really good at executing that. That's blowing up right now. And mm. my expectation is that technology is going to get democratized with companies and then with people. Um, yep. And that's a great thing because right now that, that you know, right now yeah. it's you know, a lot of technology in the consumer space is, you know, like uh, 1960s and 70s yeah. tobacco companies. You know, they've wired it with so much engineering that they're addicting everyone, people, children, all for their engagement-based monetization models. And the okay. only answer to that, ultimately, is you can't even regulate that out. That's not going to happen. You're going to have some regulation that probably you know, like limits some of what they can do. The real yeah. solution is to empower the humans on the other side of the API from the giant aggregator and start with the companies, move to the humans because the companies have the resources. So I think we're about to see that yep. shift over the next 20 years. It's predictable because it's happened every darn time with compute where yeah. there is a winner-take-all set of hubs – then those tools get invested in and democratized, and then it becomes decentralized and it's a competition. And my belief is that not necessarily, oh, it has to happen. I wouldn't be that arrogant, but it should happen. And yeah. I hope it happens and it's better for the world if it happens. So No, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. There's so many things that I want to dive deep into. But that last point you mentioned, right, how the, the, the centralization was almost needed to ensure that all the research dollars, all the you know, innovation that happens is just all like focused and centralized, right? And if you, the, the, the joke is right now, it's not a joke. It's actually, I think, true that more than 50% of all AI research were funded by social media and retail. I mean, just online yeah. shopping, yeah. which is true if you think about it, right? So, well, that was great that you centralized everything. Now the tools are the accessibility of that more democratized. And back to your original point about modern model-driven approaches and stuff to humans can model the world a lot better than machines can disparately talk to each other and do, at least today, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much nuances in the entire way we view, view the world and stuff, right? And we don't even understand how the human brain works. So it actually, to me, it, it's like a, uh, it's almost natural that it has to happen because the only way you can unlock value that you haven't unlocked so far is to go back to that human 
for them, make them the central of everything for drive the model driven programming and democratize the tooling for them to use to go solve the big problems, right? I mean, uh, so it's fascinating. Yeah, there's, there's it's ironic more... because you, you, the huge open source. So one of the things that, that is interesting is and you brought it up in the statistics of the funded research. So I think, you know, 10 years ago, seven years ago, most of the large companies, the Googles and others, they realized there was a real threat for disruption if someone emerged with a real innovation in AI. Yep. And given their capital disparity, they just scorched earth the, on the idea of IP and AI. <laughs> So what they've yeah. really done is they basically have outraced everybody, outspent everybody, and open sourced it, so that someone can't leverage that very well. And they may have benign justifications, but there's also a pretty shrewd reason for doing it. Now, the irony, though, is that actually I think will be partially the undoing of their monopoly because you know yeah. if you lower the entry costs by open sourcing all this, then what yeah. you really need is a new business model, and you need an application that is compelling with it, that drives the disruption. And the applications come from entrepreneurs a lot easier than they come from big companies because yes. we get frustrated with the gap not being met and we get motivated and we have teams that get motivated. And then with the tool was super cheap to build with, I mean, just like think about how limited the options were for CPUs in the 70s, you know, versus say the, the late 80s, early 90s, how much by the early 90s, it matters so much more what version of Windows you're running than whether you're running a Dell or a Compaq. And I think that's the analogy here uh, with clouds is those guys are, are going to be you know, competing for it, but, and they'll have different tooling, but the really interesting thing is going to happen up, you know, further up the stack. Um, and I don't underestimate them. They're, they're amazing businesses. The value they created literally gone from companies that have been almost non-existent 20 years ago to be worth trillions. So yes. like that's, you know, but, but there is yeah. a day and age, things and so this is no, you where, know, in fact, well, I don't you're, know if you're super long on it versus alternatives no no it's it's you're, you're so right because I think you know even like if you really look at what's happening even with the big you know the Googles of the world or the Microsofts of the world right they're also kind of shifting their business model to say I'm going to sell digital real estate cloud computing capacity yeah. right and I'll give you yeah. all the tooling that you want to go do it so my value proposition while it was searched 10 years ago I mean, it still is because Google is still the largest used search engine. Doesn't do a very good job of it, but you know that part of that semantic layer, the application layer, may be disrupted. But they can win by actually making sure they're focusing on the infrastructure side and make that more accessible, more attractive to go pe uh, get people to come and build. Right. So it, it it's almost like you know when in that journey of actually that democratization that leads to this decentralization. Now the arms race for them is also. How do you provide the most efficient infrastructure for those builders to go do it? Anyway, yeah. so it's a That's fascinating right. me. One, yeah. one, one part that I wanted to actually uh, ask you pointedly on, like you said that the Platonian uh, versus the Aristotelian, Aristotle approaches, right? So the whole notion of model-driven versus almost like learning-oriented, data-driven kind of an approach. Yeah, inductive right? and empirical. I mean, this is classic deductive, right. inductive reasoning. Yeah, so. What is the... how? How does that model, I know we kind of talked about it, but like what, does, what model is going to win out in general with AI in the coming days? I don't think one wins out. I, I think that the, the magic uh, is that the human mind does both. Yeah. And so, you know, basically my belief is that the under, um, so, you know, I had a, a good bit of uh, work in sort of uh, pragmatism and like not the, you know, Kind of relativistic political pragmatism jokes we have today, but like the real people who did the work in the early 1900s, like per Pierce and others. Uh, so the, like basically um, there is an, a notion of abduction, you know, which essentially is the abstraction of structure. And there's a bit of a bridge between those two schools. Um, and my belief is that, you know, essentially as things harden, and this is not novel. I don't want to, like, this is not like an opinion uh, you know, like I'm we weaving like Jeff Hawkins and other people together with some other, you know, people that publish in this and, you know, some of Minsky's ideas. Mm. So like none of this is mine. I think it's literally you just look at um, very compelling uh, thinking uh, around, um, you know, th these areas for so many years. Mm. And what you end up with is, you know, it's probably somewhere between, you know, a neural and a graphical model based on the level of abstraction and the kind of compute. I think that the area that we haven't spent a lot of innovation on um, is, well, let me, I'm going to jump into two things. One is, um, you know, many, many, many years ago, you know, the most influential paper, arguably in AI, was the unreasonable effectiveness of data. 
Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that whoever had you know the most data was going to win because the algorithms were negligibly different. I think that was actually a local maxima. That was a wrong idea. Yeah. And I believe the real innovation, you know, is still to come and it's still in progress uh, as we need to make AI much more multifunctional. So that's where you're seeing yeah. generative and classifier based architectures yeah. living together that's seamlessly, amazing. like in GPT-3 and other things. Um, you're going to see uh, inference and planning and reinforcement based approaches. You'll see these different pieces come together, I believe, over the next several years. And some of the newer startups in this space are trying to do that. I mean, David Ferriucci would know most of this from his Watson work and what he's doing with Element right now. So yeah. there's, so I, I would say that like, there are people who have really, really worked on the problem that understand there isn't a one school or the other. It really, and it is not just trying to be, uh, you know, what is the word, um, um, uh, uh, diplomatic. Like it truly is that the human mind is such an amazing piece of work yeah. Uh, yeah. that, it, it, it's because, and often when we don't respect it, it's because we we basically have tried to oversimplify it, and then we get yeah. surprised. And I believe that you know people that take it with some measure of humility, the design of the human mind, you know, would view that you know there's a lot of different parts of our work in algorithms and in yeah. semantic systems that have to come together. And you know, there's a lot of my original uh, interest in the space was much more around software agents actually than in unstructured data. This is not a well-known yeah. thing, except the ones that are people that are close to me. But anyone who goes and reads my early patents, like you'll see there's as much time, if not more, spent on agents than there is on text models being developed. And the reason for that was um, my belief is that um, you have to engage with the world in an almost embodied way uh, to be able to truly ground what these symbols mean from you know, many diverse experiences. Yeah. And I believe that, um, you know, that's I, I think that no one. I don't think I've seen one. I think there's few that would disagree with that, but a lot of people are spending time on shallower problems uh, because you can get so much yield. I mean, like the software that's being displaced in the enterprise space, as you know, as well, if not better than I, like the software being displaced in the enterprise space, it's just really, really dumb. And <laughs> the idea that all these mistakes aren't just observed and repeated. I mean, the whole RPA space, an amazing innovation for the last five years is for the most part, taking really basic and dumb things and automating them and things that could have been done 10 years ago, but to the credit of UiPath and others yeah. and executing it, they executed amazingly. Sure. Uh, and, you know, these are credit for what they built in value, but there's a lot of low hanging fruit. So I do believe we're in, we're in peak monetization for AI for the next five to seven years, especially in the enterprise. Um, so any company there that's remotely confident, I think is going to have an amazing outcome because they're on such a tailwind and it's ironic with all the, you know, the giant kind of breakdown of tech valuations in the last six months that, uh, I mean, this is a great time to be an investor because honestly, like coming into companies that are doing monetizable, you know, AI that's really useful. Uh, I mean, there was a 40% increase in spending over the in the last 12 months. I don't know if you saw that or not, but like wow. massive spend in that space. And people were asking about you, know, where did all the workers go? Well, I'm increasingly becoming less interested in where do they go to where are they going to be at in 18 months when essentially some of that's been automated while everybody else kind of felt they could take their time in the best job market ever, right? Yeah. And uh, I hope there's a kind of a, what they call it, it's a soft landing on that problem, right? Where essentially you end up with a set of tools that bring, unleash a productivity revolution that we desperately yeah. need right now you know, to maintain you know, even democracy. Yeah. No, we just, you know, I, you know, you're, you're, you're so right. And I think, you know, but, you know, but historically, if you look at it, every time that you have this, this, this waves, if you will, right, you know, you, people will, as you drive more and more productivity and efficiency in the way work is done, where humans are amazing at actually finding new work to do, <laughs> right? So, and then we'll just add that's on right, to it. That's right. A lot more value, right? The rate of value creation might, you know, will definitely increase as a process. So, no, it's, it's, uh, let me shift gears to, Enterprises, yeah, please. right? And, and mm -hmm. um, tell me about, like, you know, where what does it mean to be AI ready, given where we are today, right? For mm -hmm. enterprises, right? Because it's very different. Like five years ago, it was more, you know, it was very different uh, monikers of how you're really ready for AI, right? Things have changed mm -hmm. dramatically, right? Now, right? And, and I want to actually touch upon that five to seven years of peak monetization with AI. What do you need to do today to actually be ready to do that? Right, where should you be today and what does it mean to be AI ready? 
Um, I mean, I think that, so one of the, if you rewind seven years ago, this was just the big data wave, right? I mean, we were kind of in the middle, the upper side of the big data wave, you know, Hadoop and whatnot. And, you know, I, I was really privileged to know some of the great innovators like, you know, the Jeff Harebockers and Mike Olson and others that you know, had built out some of that and others. I mean, I, you know, so I got to watch it happen and what they did the service on was they really made um, the tooling that allowed you to do models mainly on structured data because it wasn't really heavy on AI, but more on you know, typical analytics, basically a new kind of BI at scale. And a lot of that work has started to be absorbed by, you know, the terror or by the, uh, uh, the snowflakes and some others now, right. Uh, it's all, you know, as a service and some people have raced to catch up. Uh, so what I'd say is that the last four or five years were really about make sure you can uh, access your data and do the work of trying to, uh, it used to be, I dreamed that people would come up with a giant knowledge graph of their enterprise. I don't know, frankly, how feasible it is having kind of, you know, slam at that wall for 20 years. Um, and the reason is as much uh, the social dynamics of large organizations. You know, people tend to protect their data because data enables applications, enables value, enables my career. Uh, and when, it, unless you have a real visionary, you know, leader driving it, uh, you know, from a technology leader and a CEO that backs them, um, I think it's hard to achieve, you know, this really great data architecture, but I do believe that there's immense value, like multiples of value tied up in these enterprises, if they understood their own data well. And that, you know, seven to 10 years of education we've just gone through has been very helpful in making that aware. Um, mm -hmm. I think yeah. there's work to be done there. So I, I get into it that you know, the AI being applied uh, to be unleashed for a large enterprise is generally subject to either the vendor's data and how good mm -hmm. they pre-trained it sure, and yeah. or your data so that it can be fit to purpose. Like those are the big like barriers. And we, in digital reasoning, you know, we spent about seven years uh, building out, uh, you know, I would say the market leading uh, compliance and surveillance capability for unstructured data in the industry. You know, we took over from autonomy and some of the assets that, that they had left and computer associates and others and, and converted a lot of those large enterprises. And it was hard work and it was messy work. Uh, and the hard work was, um, you know, if you're running LP on, Oh, something on the order of 500 to a billion emails and chats and other things a year in a large mm -hmm. bank. That's a non-trivial amount of processing. At least it used to be five years ago. It was a lot, you know, to now probably less so given where things sure. are at, but still interesting. Then it becomes an indexing issue. But really the issue is the behaviors you want to do and find like secrecy and collusion and, you know, especially mm -hmm. collusion is super difficult to do. Um, it, it's challenging to make, uh, models that are robust in the face of highly imbalanced data and rare events. Um, because, you know, even if you're, you know, 70%, but the event is so rare, you might end up creating an enormous amount of false positives because you're processing so much versus the actual number of true positives. <laughs> so you have to be very clever, you know, in that problem uh, when you're using classification mainly. Um, and so I think that where enterprises get the most yield now is mainly in uh, relatively straightforward classification problems. Um, and what they could do a lot more on is find and create learning loops between their people and the machine. Once again, this is where RPA, I think, has made some progress, but I believe that there's a lot more to be done in the unstructured area, like complaint management. Yep. Um, I mean... I, I find it amazing. Uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you know, I've set on about two, like setting up flights and trying to change them in a couple situations, like because something happened. I've had two and three hour, sometimes near infinite call waiting periods, you know, with airlines. Yeah. And yeah. so I do believe there's this massive need now uh, to create. And then also when you, when you deal with a computer, you know, generated decision tree of, you know, press, you know, four for this and three for this and two for this. And then you're left with it finally getting a direct statement from you. You just dread it because you just know yeah. how much it's going to miss and then how frustrating. And then you're right back, you know, to the beginning sure. and you hit reset, just trying to get a human. So <laughs> until we can solve that problem well, like there's an enormous amount of arbitrage that's missing uh, on human time uh, and it's creating a terrible experience 
So I guess I'm saying is there's a lot of classification problems where we have more than adequate data in enterprise to teach something to be 98% or 95% or 97%. And it approaches near human level effectiveness. And we aren't doing that nearly enough based on the experiences people are having with that kind of AI. Um, and I do believe that when that gets nailed, you're going to have a transformative moment in humans accepting support from machine. Um, yeah. And so that would be one. I mean, you're in the healthcare space. You've got a really cool company in this, as you're telling me about. And you know, I think you're onto something in terms of the kind of insights and value you get from that data. I mean, I, I actually, you're the host, so maybe the, I, I'm the only one that can ask you this. But, you know, giving that example to this audience, you know, I'd love to, you, know, you take two minutes on it, Ganesh, and then tell people because I think it's a great example of something that could get unlocked and a ton of value in these, you know, you know probably in the providers, but of use to pharma and others. Yeah. And that's just waste right now. If it's not being unleashed, it's just wasted. No, no, no. I, and I'm happy to actually. And I think that I want to just call out something you said. I think optimizing for applying, solving problems that are valuing human time and driving you know, more efficiency on that use of human time is a huge part of it. So, I mean, to your point, Autonomize, uh, we're building a healthcare data company. And the whole idea is like, how do you really take all that messy, uh, siloed, mostly unstructured healthcare data and make it really computable and analyzable at scale, right? I mean, that's the real problem we're solving. And the, the, I mean, it affects the entire ecosystem and not just, you know, the initial market where we're focused on clinical trials, where how do you automate or really accelerate the patient selection problem for by looking at medical history, which is hundreds of thousands of pages per patient. And, you know, you're, some human is actually making those connections and synapses firing in their head saying, oh yeah, this actually makes sense from the lab report. And I'm looking at the pathology report, it says something else and you're linking and synthesizing everything. It's an engineerable problem. And that's what we're solving, right? We actually just can narrow down that haystack from maybe let's say a hundred thousand patients, 200 patients that you can do deep reviews on. You're providing a premium for the human time, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. And you're actually accelerating uh, you're, you're really applying the, the, the technologies like natural language processing and stuff to really understand the nuances of what is not in, in easily structured, you know, computable data, if you will. Right. So, no, pretty excited about what we're building. And thanks for your support, too. I think, um, no, you, but a few things I want to just call out. And as you said, like, for what does it mean to be AI ready? Coming back to that topic. One, you're right. I've been mean, selecting the right problem, making sure you're pointing it to the right thing. Like, and I love that the 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 theme of, you know, um, premium on human time. So how do you actually use that as a way, as a moniker, as a clicker? You you mentioned a little bit about data, right? And I think in terms of like data readiness from, you know, well, there, there are two problems here. One is either you're going to, you know, the quality of the vendor's data when they're actually bringing in pre-trained models versus do you have the right data at the right quality at the right amount? And then the infrastructure and tooling to actually go immediately get value out of it by, you know, getting it there. Talk to me a little bit about data in terms of like data readiness for AI, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what do you see in, the, in uh, organizations or enterprises today and what should they be focusing? I mean, a lot of everybody started a data lake project and a data warehousing project after Snowflake. So all of a sudden you have more silos of data, right? So, but tell, talk to me a little yeah. bit about that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's messy. Um, you know, there, there's still the sort of the, uh, what I call the aftermath of the unfulfilled like vision of autonomy, you know, which was essentially to you know, index and put together all this data, you know, go from uh, originally make it all searchable in the enterprise, but then they got into archiving and all these other pieces. And, you know, it was a fairly broad product, but I think that the vision didn't end up getting executed, uh, nearly meeting the expectations and the need is still very much there. So, yeah. so for instance, I was uh, I, I had a chance to you know catch up and get a lunch with a friend of mine who uh, she's the CTO of one of the largest banks in the world and you know wonderful person and they were launching a, a very broad data project and you know I think that the the courage of that is important when you're dealing with the unstructured data yeah. because yeah. essentially number one are you capturing all the data you know are you even able to know it exists you know where it is if it's captured is it is it stored and retained and there's a regulatory element you know the the company that acquired digital reasoning smarsh which has some you know wonderful technology wonderful people in it um like they're you know they're in that space you know actively working and solving that problem probably doing it with more people than anybody else and, and so I, I they're like that's an example of a company that's doing a real solution in this yeah. um and then there are others you know in this space but like that's part of the problem then there is the okay if you can 
know if you can capture it, if you can store it and retain it, can you get intelligence from it? And, and intelligence has different varieties. There's sure. intelligence in terms of a set of use cases that are wired into that infrastructure, like we did with surveillance, for instance. Okay. Yeah. There's other use cases, which are, can you use it essentially as a replacement or a, a true execution of the unstructured data lake with a model that sits over it that makes yeah. it accessible and usable? Exactly. And at that point, this is where the analogy of like in healthcare might be interesting is, you know, you have all these things coming in with like HL7 and other things, but the bottom line is like, there's these massive unstructured fields there and something needs to index all that and start to find, you know, entities of interest in that and then tie it together and then you get statistics. So, you know, statistics drives trends, trends can drive decisions, um, you know, ex basically extracting certain kinds of things can drive alerting. So there's a yeah. set of use cases that are like alerting you know, intelligence and trending, prediction, that all come off these fundamental foundational pieces. I totally um, agree. And, and I think that's the part where we, you know, we it's still incomplete and it's still bespoke. Um, and the cloud companies have provided pieces of the puzzle so you could potentially wire it together. And they've done a little bit of a siren song with a variety of large enterprise CIOs that, you know, gold teams yeah. are trying to do this. But honestly, if you don't have a vendor or a set of vendors who are investing to do this and doing it um, with, you know, dozens of customers so they can do the hard product work of what's important to put capital behind, what's less important. Yeah. Like you end up with things that end up being unmaintainable because you get too customized too early. Get snowflakes. And, yeah. and there are a few organizations can succeed in that because they just have such capital and talent. But, yeah. you know, those are not, those are the exceptions, not the rules. So I do believe there's still a need for a set of leaders to emerge around this problem. And when that, that gets solved, all this cool stuff opens up, which is, okay, you know, I want to pull one of these hundred models that are pre-built for this kind of classification problem. You know, maybe it's around complaints. Maybe it's around, you know, one I've, I've just been stunned we haven't done yet uh, in the industry is, you know, we spend massive amounts of time trying to decide who to promote. And who to give more comp to, like in any company, <laughs> the data yes. of how other peers and how customers are responding to them is all there in your communications. Open, and yeah. no one is quantifying that to drive the scoring to make it objective, which still creates a lot of skepticism about those decisions and leads to people leaving because they're overlooked without objectivity. Yeah, no, you know, we're like, uh, no, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I can... There's a lot of things that that you just packed in that a little thing. And the last point on, you know, this notion of actually identifying key opinion leaders and uh, influencers and looking at peer groups to actually focus on what kind of content, what kind of people, how do you promote and stuff like that. Uh, we're doing that in pharma for uh, mm -hmm. several large pharmas right now at Autonomize, where we are trying to actually help them with their drug launches. So understanding from the public domain data sets you know, being able to understand peer groups and cohort behavior to focus on what's the right message, what's the right uh, positioning and things like that. But the, the only thing that you actually said, like, you know, there's there's so much to unpack here. If you, when you're dealing with unstructured data, I think my, my note, quick note I made was like, how do you get data right? Have courage. <laughs> I love that. You know, so <laughs> it's very courageous. You've got to have courage, right? But the notion of, you know, like we, we've done, we I think we've had like five or six decades of, you know, transactional systems, right? Uh, online transactional systems, yeah, yeah. which has just completely flattened the data availability and accessibility for everybody. It's all a spreadsheet, right? And so transactional mm -hmm. data is the way the world views the data today. Even though if you really look at us humans, our visual field is actually multidimensional. It's, you know, it's more than, yeah, and then, yeah. uh, sensory perception is more than, you know, just three dimensions. So I believe like this whole notion of how do you, you know, when you actually talk about unstructured data, just extracting entities and putting into a spreadsheet is not going to cut it. You really have to understand the intent, the context, and all the different things. Mm -hmm. And then creating that as the level of abstraction for you to apply those classification models, those clustering models and stuff. I think that's the big uh, opportunity we're trying to unlock at uh, Autonomize. But we're starting with healthcare initially. Uh, but I think the entire industry, all of the different uh, subsectors and industries need that. Right? You have to create a higher mm -hmm. level of abstraction on data to drive more model-driven innovation, if you will. So fascinating. Um, Tim, yeah, let me agree. switch. Agree. Right? Let me ask you one more thing for enterprises, and then I'll switch into a little bit of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and you know, vendors and stuff like that, right? 
what's like some top three advice for C-suite executives and leaders, this organization leaders to win with AI over the next decade? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'd say the first of all is there really is a lot of low hanging fruit. And so if you're talking about the C-level leaders, um, you know, I mean, I look at this, let's say you're talking about CTO of a global bank and they've got, you know, five or six managing directors that are either, you know, you know, group or, you know, or CIO of a bank and they've got six or seven CIOs underneath them, for instance. I know one bank definitely organized that way. It'd be three or four. Um, they should be able to bring you a list of low hanging fruit. Uh, and low hanging fruit means, you know, I can, I can demonstrate this yield of gains by either, you know, customers retain, being retained. I, I can drive more share of wallet. I, I mean, I, I can basically, so I'd say is right now in this current environment, um, I think the big thing is um, we're past the point where um, I think you should be accepting, this is great, let's do it. Uh, I hope this is going to work. It should work. That That's generally um, not the right level of discipline now after all the money that's been spent. Yeah. And, and I say this just because like, uh, it's still a lot of sizzle. There's still a lot of BS out there. You know, there's a lot of kind of marketing of stuff and the rest of it. What is, this is the era of AI solutions creating yield. And I believe that um, you can ask that of your teams to come with a true business case on it and then have the courage to, to back them. Uh, and, and I believe that, you know, like my, my number one thinking right now is, um, your customers should be having a much better experience because the cost to understand things that used to be essentially not able to be understood, you know, mm -hmm. from their sentiment to, you know, their communication behavior, all those things is it's both possible mm -hmm. now and it's actually not that expensive to do. And if you use it right, it makes you almost a clairvoyant company. Um, and I think you can tie that in with your brand and marketing and, and create a, a aura of, Wow. You know, I think, I think I'll, I'll give you a brand that I used to you know, do all the time with Southwest. Okay. Southwest, you know, kind of, you know, it, you know, everyone loads up. It's like, you know, hurting everybody in and whatnot, you know, no sign seats it used to be just the cheapest way to go and, but, but bankable and on time all the time. And I feel like that's fallen off. My own experience has been fairly weak. I feel like their customer service has fallen off. I've just, I've experienced really negative things there. I was a 10 year companion pass holder. I mean, I'm kind of one of the higher ends of them given how much used to travel. And, um, and I'll just say that like their lack of understanding of me as a customer is an a bit of an indictment of their, you know, yeah. whether it's their culture, it's probably at least their technology stack. And yeah. so like, to me, there's a lot of that going on because people got distracted. They're busy enabling their firms to work remotely. And then, and so, you know, there is the classic, you know, no difference between the important and the urgent. AI right now is super important. There are other things like connectivity and then reporting and, you know, yeah, gathering the data yeah. and react, those things that are urgent. But what will make the winners be the winners in terms of IT leadership investments is number one, higher standards of return on those AI investments because those companies are out there that will do it. Those companies are out there that will sign up for it. They will look at structures. So I think structures which, you know, potentially are partially contingent. Um, the uh, meaning base price and maybe get a percentage you know, of the value. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great time to negotiate those. Okay. Because companies that are hungry will take that on and they'll find a way even in, you know, not the great capital raising environment to make it work. And they'll crush it because they'll win with you. So I'd say, you know, economics are more fungible in this environment. I mean, you should be able to get more projects going. You should have a higher standard of what yield is. You should look for the low hanging fruit because what you want to do is you want to be a success factory to the executive leadership you're having to educate about what can get done. Because yeah. yeah. you don't want your, your executive leadership, your CEO, whoever she or he may be, like you don't want them getting out marketing it and then having trouble delivering on it. Uh, but if you give them a set of proof cases to, to drop, then, you know, that is kind of the, the world of difference. And, and there's just so many. And then there's sort of what I'd call the gyms. The, when you put in the infrastructure to create uh, a high probability yielding automation, yep. 
there will be insights to follow. So I'll give an example, like a, a company I'm super proud of. It was sort of the healthcare arm of digital reasoning and it spun out called Azure.ai. Like, so they, um, you know, they ended up, you know, automating the navigation and helping a large healthcare company automate the navigation of like one out of 10 cancer patients in all the U.S. Okay. And they probably have found thousands and thousands of lives together, you know, in late stage cancer that may not have lived over the last several years together with those healthcare companies. So the healthcare companies, the providers are the heroes, but, you know, the wizards with the tools are, were some of the team I used to have. And they're still doing great, you know, Lord's work kind of stuff out there. Well, they have a new app and they've had an app for a while, but it's incidental findings. And so they're basically using the same data to figure out um, other ways you might be sick that were nothing to do with the reason you came for diagnosis. So the infrastructure to make a ridiculously valuable automation that had just a killer ROI for you know, for-profit healthcare and other providers has this secondary great use case yeah. that is unlocked right on top of it just with more models. So the reason you focus as a C-level exec on sort of the slam dunk, but the slam dunk over enough data is you get the hard work paid for of making the data able to be understood. And then you just layer models. And those models that come in is the gift that keeps on giving. And, that, and that's yeah. to me the way you almost ensure success as a C-level executive on these problems. Um, and I'm trying to give advice at the level that they have to deal with. I'm not here to tell them what stack to use, what cloud player to use, what vendor yeah. to use. That That's different. It's the leadership and how you structure the rules and engagement with your team, the standard you set, and then being strategic, which means making the right sequence of investments with capital so that the later investments get radically higher yield on less subsequent capital. Sure. No, no, totally, totally makes sense. No, it's, that's a, it's an amazing framework. Um, I want to shift gears onto the last part of the thing. And I promise we're going to wrap up after this. Um, it's all good. This is, is fun. You know, this is a lot of fun. I mean, I've learned so much in this conversation too, but I want to actually touch upon a little bit more of Tim Estes as an entrepreneur, right? And, you know, you, I, I mentioned this right before we started recording I mean, like you built a company, you went through the entire, you, you grew the baby from what it was over 20 years. That's the, I mean, the, the ultimate lesson in entrepreneurship is persistence and making sure that you're actually driving um, a, a focused journey over a long period of time, long-term focus and so forth, right? Well, you know, give me like quickly, what did you learn? I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of learnings. What's the top few things that stand out that you would offer as advice to entrepreneurs in your journey, from your journey? Um, you know, I, I, 20 years is a no time to sort of, you know, and I've had a year or so of, of transition, you know, the you know, acquisition, uh, merger that turned into an acquisition. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think I've had perspective now of six months of kind of not doing anything, uh, which is amazing after 22 years of, you know, a certain velocity. Um, you know, I think that I have the gift of challenges and mistakes that, can be provided to others. Uh, and that's been really a really fruitful thing for me to spend time on the last several months. And I have, you know, a bit, a bit of contentment in what was done and what was built out. Um, and, and then you have the economics of it, which is kind of cool. And so you have like those different things, but um, what I'd say over that period of time, you know, to give it a little bit of a, a flavor, like I, I've dealt with, you know, most of the things a company or multiple people from multiple companies dealt with. Uh, I've had, um, you know, I've had, run out of money and had to lay everybody off and not, not have the company go under. I've had a situation where we ran out of money and 15 people in my company that stayed without salary for five months. I took out a second mortgage in my home to pay them. And then we paid them all back and then gave them equity. Like when we actually got on our feet. And so, you know, I'm the beneficiary of a lot of heroic uh, individuals who were committed uh, during the time, you know, hundreds of them literally that I've had the privilege of, of being in the team. Um, and, and I've had to, I've had to watch people, you know, have great ability and, and have some success in my organization and then go on to something else, get frustrated, leave, be sad they left and then watch them bloom, you know, in, in other capacities. And I've been able to kind of cheer them on. Uh, one of my, uh, you know, uh, favorite researchers uh, going, getting his doctorate at Oxford and now has the leading, you know, open source project for federated private AI in the world on GitHub and massive following. Wow. Uh, and so he's making great good in the world, you know, after having left digital reasoning. Um, and, and so I, I just have these different stories that decorate it. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, more than a podcast, it's a dinner with, you know, some wine or sometimes something stronger uh, to go through all of it. 
Um, but what I can say is this, is the most important thing as an honor, I would say, the fundamental most important thing is um, you make a commitment to everybody that um, invest in you. And whether they invest in capital, they invest part of their careers, they invest um, you know, as a customer. Um, what carries on, it used to be just called reputation, but it's more than that. What carries on in terms of your integrity and your soul is how do you live that? How do you honor that? Um, and you can't control the circumstances. I went from a company that hit 60% plus AR growth in 2019 to one that we exited in 2020 when the pandemic hit. Um, and, you know, I, so I've been to the ups and downs. I mean, I hired an amazing uh, president, co-CEO in the last year, a wonderful guy who was an early investor in the company. Uh, and just, I mean, I don't know that we would have, you know, gotten through some of the challenges yeah. times without Brooke. Um, and so I, I say that honestly, and this is a man who had to do his first all hands as co-CEO remotely and never met the whole team because of the pandemic. So I've, I've seen sort of that piece, nice. you know, I've had the investor that pulled out the markets, uh, the day the markets opened after 9-11 and I had to go oh. turn around a car and go, you know, dial for dollars and fail and lay everybody off. And, and, you know, and live on pork and beans for, I don't know, six months waiting for something to turn and then end up briefing a guy that ended up being the chief scientist at the National Security Agency a few years later. And then, boom, all this stuff happens. So I've kind of like, you know, I've lived that weird life from those extremes. But the one thing that's never changed, uh, and I don't say this in any kind of, you know, um, and I say it from standpoint of someone that I think is being human about it. I mean, there are many people along the way that I have, I have no doubt I'm disappointed and there are many people that have said yeah. generous things about me and, and, you know, so I've seen both of those extremes, but the intent to live up to uh, the commitments and the faith of others has always been at the heart of things. And I think good entrepreneurs, that's important. Um, it's not something that is talked about in the books the same way. In fact, sure. I actually think a lot of the venture community and the Silicon Valley community, um, oh. And maybe in some way, this is also true in New York and what I've seen there is um, like really making company building a transactional process. And I believe it robs the soul of a company to be transactional versus relational. Um, and so I, I tend to do whatever I can to help, you know, grounded, relational, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that have a compelling mission driven business be successful because I believe that's where we're good. You know, in, in this side, you know, there's a lot of ways to do good in the world. I mean, you can go, you know, help serve the poor in places where people are really poor instead of in the U.S. where some people are poor and nothing like most of the rest of the world. No. You know, you can do a lot of good things. I mean, you can, you know, deal with children who, you know, were unwanted and actually, you know, give them homes. I mean, there's a lot of things that are really important in this world to do. You know, when you're being a CEO or you're building a company, um, you have to have a certain commitment if you want to make that important, too. It's not important because people pay for it a lot. I mean, I guess that's one way to look yeah. at it. But, you know, that, that world will fade. It will pass mission. away. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that the impact of it, like uh, the thing I'm most proud of is still, there's a reason we did many good things. The thing I'm most proud of uh, is something we never really made any money on at all, which was we built the largest anti-child sex trafficking tool used in the U.S. in partnership with Thorne, Ashton Kutcher's charity, mm -hmm. Amy Moore's charity, and Julie Corder, who's the CEO there, who's an amazing human being. And I remember when it was like five amazing women who were just pouring themselves in to the horrible abuses that were being done to little girls online mm -hmm. um, and educating us when we knew nothing. And I remember it was to be like their development arm and and to do that. And then, there, you know, with a little bit of sadness, like watching a kid go to college, I remember it was like kind of hand the keys over mm -hmm. to a great team they had built. And I've watched them now go from like, you know, five people, like well over a hundred under Julie's leadership. Uh, and I'm just super proud of that whole journey. Um, but, you know, there's about 10,000 kids that were found online that probably wouldn't be uh, in the same, you know, they might be, you know, horribly abused even further. They might, some of them might not be alive. They would be drug. There's all these people that are impacted on that. And, you know, is that what my you know, investors funded? Well, actually, a lot of them, they knew what we were. They knew our values and they cheered it, you know, and, and I think that we never let it be a distraction. You know, we, we you know, it, it, we worked hard problems in that space. Some of the algorithms, that, you know, helped make that work to find immature children posting online escort ads, which clearly showed that they, you know, shouldn't have been escorts, but they were being used by people. Like those algorithms ended up creating the kind of technology that made secrecy possible in large banks to find that stuff.
So yeah, exactly. I think that you got to look at, you know, the, the, you know, the impact. And I guess, you know, I'm at my, my you know, midpoint, you know, in this probably, I don't think I'm going to do the next one for 20 years. Maybe I will, but I, I think that um, of, the, of what I've done um, and, and my team did, you know, I think I just plowed the way for them in many ways. Um, I think there is something to be said about, you know, really, I would rather see a bunch of good companies try to be great um, than I would necessarily uh, be cheering along a bunch of great companies that are just trying to be good, but not really caring about it. Got it. No, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, you know, um, it's beautiful how you said it. I think the three themes that I took out of that, right, for entrepreneurs is like, make that commitment to everybody in that journey. So the committing to it and that, you know, drives through, you know, have that commitment pull through and show, you know, have that integrity to actually follow through on that commitment and so forth. Uh, I love what you said about relationships and being able to actually focus on a relationship driven culture and that includes everything. And it's just like, I fundamentally, personally, I believe in like almost every outcome in life is going to be, a, you know, driven by people and relationships. I mean, yes, algorithms and machines are all around us, but that's going to drive the impactful outcomes. And then lastly, I think, you know, the, the, the finding the mission, finding that larger than yourself cost or impact that you can make to have, again, that's where it'll help you build a company for 20 plus years versus like, you know, six months and giving up because that's the light that shines through over the long term. So mm. pretty fascinating. And your story is just amazing. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So Tim, thank you so much for spending the time. Um, what's next for Tim Estes? Well, um, you know, right now uh, I have the, the most beautiful gifts of an uh, amazing uh, family, you know, amazing wife, amazing six and three-year-old boys that we're going to go overseas and spend some time. Um, <clears throat> so he's looking forward to the you know, double-decker buses and stuff. So I think, honestly, right now um, in my life, um, I'm trying to uh, take the time to you know, process a lot of this, um, not be, I, as I tell friends of mine, when I'm so antsy that I can't stand it, probably means I got to do something next. And coming up with something new to do is not the hard thing. Uh, the hard thing actually is saying, you know, don't do it yet. You know, wait for your shot. And I'd say one of the lessons learned is, you know, digital reasoning was something I started when I was 20 and I had not much of a plan, at least nothing I would call a plan by my standards today. I had a vision. The vision ended up being, you know, right at the wrong time. And essentially perseverance allowed us to stay on long and see the vision fulfilled. Um, I, I don't have to do it that way the second time around. I, sure. I think in a lot of ways, uh, I'm, what I'm highly intrigued by is I, I met with Sarah, it's an amazing time to be an investor. So I'm, I'm considering, you know, how to essentially uh, work with people toward that end. Um, I think there's some great companies out there that will be built now that, will be massively impactful and massively valuable within five to 10 years. Um, and so I, that's a pretty good use of time. Uh, and then I actually, the one thing I really, and I might end up like working on either a, a piece of writing or something around this. Um, I really believe there's like a toxic side effect of the 20 years behind just building the internet the way it is, which is the internet has been monetized based on an alternative to capitalism based on engagement and barter. Hmm. And you're burning your time and you're being addicted to using your time by technologies that are meant to use your time. <laughs> and so when technology is more capable of amplifying us and doing things for us than ever in human history, we're wasting more human time directly against a thin application via an API as humans than anything else. And so that's not right. There's something really broken in that. And so I believe there's a set of companies and maybe even a, you know, a, a specific company in that to becoming an you know, ecosystem that I might want to drive. But there's a set of companies I definitely want to see succeed that blow up that system You're using a Game of Thrones that you know, breaks the wheel. You know, I think the wheel has been the Google innovation to survive and then beat Microsoft on a lot of things, at least the old Microsoft. There's a new Microsoft now that... Um, that uh, Satya like has made amazing, you know, this an amazing kind of second coming, almost like first, like Steve Jobs did. Um, and uh, and so I think that I think honestly they built innovation, which is you know we're going to get our capital from a third party, not from the user, and then we're going to turn the user into a product. And there's actually nothing more dehumanizing to people 
sure. than to turn people into statistics and turn them into subjects of auction. I mean, yeah. my process application was finding human trafficking. We are trafficking in people's attentions using a barter system with lack of transparent value and information. And yeah. that's created trillions of dollars of value. Uh, and we're living in the aftermath of it. We're living with children that are doing horrific things off of like TikTok challenges and things like that. You know, one thing I found out in the area I'm studying a little bit, which is I don't know a single company uh, that can protect children on social media right now. And the companies that should do it have failed. And they spend a hundred times more on monetizing engagement and attention than they spend protecting the children that happen to stumble into it. Every life that's been lost that way is something that, um, you know, is an indictment of not just, you know, our values as a society, but those values of those companies. So I think we need to disrupt that. And so that's an area I'll probably spend some time on when I get back around to stuff. I'm uh, talking to people I trust and understanding that problem now. But, but yeah, on the enterprise side, I said a long track record there. I think helping people uh, in a lot of ways pro bono, you know, helping people like, you know, friends that are still in the industry make good decisions and stuff um, or, you know, tell them yeah, this is what's coming right now. Those are all things uh, that I think are interesting. So, so yeah, so there's plenty to do, but you know, I'm looking for, you know, not doing a lot for a bit uh, and enjoying <laughs> well, you, this window of my life. So you've earned it. You've definitely earned it. No, I think Tim, what a, what a pleasure. And I can't wait to see what you do next. And thank you for coming on the show. Where can the viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Where can they find you on the internet? Uh, I, I just do LinkedIn. I actually don't keep any other social media. I've got maybe a few tweets I've done. I just, you know, I, I generally can't stand the hot takeness of, of Twitter. Uh, and so, so LinkedIn's pretty much it. You know, I bought a lot of work friends there. And then, you know, I got off, I, I, I think you used to call it Facebook suicide. I actually got off in 2011 and never went back. I think I went back once to pull down some photos I couldn't find anywhere else. But other than that, like, um, you know, it's been, it's been, a, it was one of those deactivated, then totally deleted accounts because, the downside of being involved with the government and the intelligence community is you really understand how vulnerable you were. And this is why, like, I will, over my dead, dead body, never be on TikTok. You know, I, I couldn't think of a better honeypot for a nation state to run in a country than TikTok. And we just had it done to us. So yeah. uh, anyway, just you know, caveat it's, into everybody else. Uh, Find me on LinkedIn. Happy to respond there. Uh, it's owned right. by a great, respectable company, Microsoft. Bluegrass, so Awesome. Tim, thank you so much for getting on the show. This was such a blast. And uh, I'm looking forward to staying in touch. Awesome. Great. Good. Yeah. Great to see you. And we'll be in touch you. soon. Nice to meet your audience. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.